last week we celebrated the arrival of the first fleet and essentially Cook's claiming of the east coast of Australia in uh, 1770. And as Christine sorry, mentioned, um, in October we'll be celebrating uh, Dirk Hartog's landing in, on the west coast of Australia. But before all of those arrived, we have Willem Janzoon and Louis Vaz de Torres in 1606, the very first European discovery of Australia. And as, as I think in the introduction it said uh, on, the, on the website, all Australians or should know, almost all Australians should know about this, and I'm sure you all do. So let's let's go forward. This map is a Dutch map from Henry Hondius. There is a the state library has this map, it's just so you can get your bearings. So we've got Java, uh, Sumatra, Borneo, Salibis or Sulawesi, Papua, Banda, which we'll talk about, Ambon, and this land here, which is uh, another map described as part of New Guinea, but, but we know better, because it's the, uh, the west coast of Cape York, and that's where the first landings and uh, Euro European discovery of Australia was made. Okay, so why were the Dutch interested in, uh, in this part of the world? Well, it was all about spices. Now, the Portuguese and the Spanish had pioneered the spice trade. They were here almost 100 years before the Dutch, but the Dutch were more than happy to try and capture that trade. So here we have the, the products. So we've got nutmeg, we've got cloves, and we've got sandalwood. And this map was uh, essentially a prospectus for a company called the Company for Far Distant Lands. And the idea was to raise the funds for the very first Dutch voyage to the East Indies, a profit from this trade. And we'll learn a lot more about that in a minute. So again, we've got Java, Borneo, the strange looking uh, Sulawesi, and of course, New Guinea. So these are the uh, 1595, the first Dutch fleet left. So we've got the, uh, the three major ships, and we've got the, the, the brave little Dufkin, or the little dove, which was the scout boat for the exhibition expedition. Now it could sail in shallower water, it was a lot faster, it could bring messages from the flagships to the other ships back and forth. So almost every fleet had its scout vessel to do those things. So here they are leaving Amsterdam. And they, uh, they pioneered a route, uh, the first time this had been done, because the Portuguese would sail around the coast, around the Cape of Good Hope, up to India, and then across to uh, Malacca and the Malaysian Peninsula. So that the Dutch pioneered the first route directly across the, uh, the Indian Ocean to, uh, to the East Indies uh, through the, uh, the Sunda Straits between Java and Sumatra. And their destination was at the port of Banten, which is somewhere in here, uh, where the, which was a spice trading port for both cloves, nutmeg, and pepper, which grew in abundance in Sumatra and that West Java. So again, we can see the, uh, the little Dufkin there, uh, pictured in the Java Sea with the other vessels. Now that, uh, that expedition was significant. It was, a, it was a disaster. It was a commercial disaster. Uh, I think two thirds of the men died, either from scurvy or murder or accident, before the boats returned to Holland. Uh, they brought back very little spices because of the, the problems, mainly caused by the commander. But they had proof that you could, they, the Dutch could sail to the East Indies and hopefully could profit from this trade. So there was a second voyage here, um, and this is an image of the, uh, the return of the second voyage to Amsterdam, uh, which was a legendary success. Now it was a legendary success because it uh, generated 400% profits to its investors. So, and the, the church bells pealed throughout Amsterdam and the crew were paraded through the streets of Amsterdam. So but it was a real legendary success. So the Dufkin sails again in 1601, and this is an image of the Battle of Banten, where the Dutch and the Portuguese met and began to struggle for control of the spice trade. Now, this is probably a, a heroic painting rather than a, what happened in reality, but uh, somewhere in here is the little Dufkin. I don't know where it is. Uh, someone else might be able to pick it out. But uh, somewhere in there it is, it is the Dufkin. And of course, the Dutch were successful. They had better armaments, longer range, and more accurate. So I don't think there was that much of a battle. I think the Portuguese just figured that out very quickly and left. But uh, I don't really know all the details. And of course, that's a map you'll have to recognize with uh, south to the top. So we've got uh, the Monet Peninsula, Sumatra, and Bantan is located around about there. The Dutch realized they couldn't 
their, their intent now was to capture the spice trade, uh, the most valuable trade in the world at that time, other than perhaps gold and, and silver. And they couldn't do that, but there were five subsequent companies floated. So each major port city in Holland floated their own company, and they all sailed off and came back with lots of spices. But uh, the, uh, the start holder realised that uh, they would not be able to capture the trade with five different independent companies trying to battle the Portuguese. So that this, in 1602, the United Dutch East India Company was formed, which was a forced merger of all these the five different companies. And the first war fleet sailed in 1605 and captured the Portuguese forts in Ambon, uh, then Banda, and then Tadore. <coughs> this is the image of the, uh, the capture of the fort on, uh, on Tadore. Now, all these vessels have names, so if you've got really good eyesight, you can figure out which went which. which. Uh, the Dovkin was in the war fleet, but it, uh, it did not participate in the attack on, uh, on Tadore because it had a more important mission to carry out, and we'll learn in a minute what that was. So this is the map we saw earlier. So we've got, again, the nutmeg, cloves, and sandalwood, uh, the north coast of New Guinea. Now, this is the Dutch map. The Dutch had never, ever been anywhere near this part of the world. So these were maps that were stolen, copied, whatever, from the, the Portuguese and the Spanish. And uh, basically, the Portuguese owned this half of the world, and the Spanish owned that half of the world, as according to the Treaty of Tordesillas, if you're familiar with that, where the uh, but the Pope broke an agreement where the Portuguese and Spanish divided the world in half, and uh, that was very convenient for them. But anyway, in 1528, this gentleman, Saavedra, tried to sail back from Tadore uh, along back to across the Pacific, and part of that voyage was along the north coast of, of New Guinea, which he named as Sola del Oro, the Island of Gold. So it's a too, far too provocative a name to give an island. So in 1545, it was changed to New Guinea. But obviously that, that idea hung around. Now, I don't know how Saavedra got that name. There is obviously gold in New Guinea. So he must have found some gold on the north coast or the natives were wearing gold jewelry. Um, I don't know where that came from. But anyway, the, um, so the Dovkin is, is now going to go and explore uh, the island of gold. So it went back to, uh, to Banten and resupplied and then sailed uh, first to Banda. So you're probably aware of the, the replica Dovkin built in Fremantle by, uh, by the good people there. So this is the replica Dovkin, which spent almost a year in, in Sydney Harbour at the Maritime Museum, has sailed around Australia, has sailed to the Spice Islands, has sailed to, uh, to Amsterdam and Rotterdam, display in, in, uh, in Fremantle near the uh, Maritime Museum there. So there it is in Banda Harbour, a beautiful vessel. So all the logs from the, this voyage, from the Dovkin, have never been found. And the maps were never found until fairly recently. So what we know of the voyage is from this Captain John Saris, who's with the English East India Company in Bantam. So he says here on the 18th of 16, November 1605, a small pinnace or small vessel of the Flemings or the Dutch uh, was sailing to New Guinea, which is said afforded the great store of gold. So it sailed from uh, Bantam, probably to Ambon, then to Banda, and then sailed on. Now, I sent the, uh, the, the, the logs of the voyage, the chronicle of the voyage, has never been found. Uh, and the maps of the voyage were, were found as recently as 1920 in the Austrian National Library. So the Blau Atlases were famous, of course. Uh, this was a seven-volume one, left, sorry, 11-volume atlas. And uh, Laurens van der Hem uh, was a wealthy collector. And sometime after, six, around 1670, uh, someone had probably removed the maps of the Dufkin voyage from the uh, VOC archives and copied them. And since they're no longer in the archives, I assume they never got back there. So there they are. Might still be out there somewhere. But anyway, uh, Lorenz van der Hem acquired the copies and stuck them in the back of the Blau Atlas. So when he died and that went on to uh, Austria and finally into the uh, off bibliotech, this gentleman, Dr. Wider, was examining them, examining the Blau Atlas and found the, uh, the uh, what's called the secret atlas of the Dutch East India Company in the back of it. Uh, copies of maps no longer in the company's archive. And these show the voyages that we're, we're going to talk about. So this is the copy, and I'll show you details of the individual maps. But uh, the, there's an inscription in Dutch there which translates uh, as that. So we get, these are the Bander Islands. So the outward voyage was from Bander to Kai, then to Aru, and then down to the Papuan coast, and then finally down to uh, New Guinea, this little piece of map there. And then the return voyage was up 
past what is, is now called High Island to the, what's described as the Money Banks, then back around New Guinea to uh, Papua. Uh, we've got any New Zealanders in the, in the audience? Of course, you've noticed that New Zealanders move. Continental Drift explains yeah. that. And then back to Banda. So uh, we'll just look at detail of that map. Also, this is the, the Dufkin, the replica Dufkin, sailing in, uh, in high seas down the coast of uh, New South Wales, or up the coast of New South Wales. So this is the first part of that map, pretty self-explanatory. On the voyage back, we'll talk a bit about their landing in Papua. So this is where the, the first uh, landing was made, at what is now uh, at the Penny Father River, and it was called uh, River Met Het Bush. So we have the first bush in Australia. And, uh, and this bay here, if you can read this, is translated as Fly Bay. So we already, already have a good description of Australia, bush and flies. Uh, and then the, the Dufkin sailed down, there was some contact with the Aborigines, and then sailed down as far as Cape Kewir, which is Cape Turnaround, came back, uh, sailed past what is described there as the High Island, or the Hoog Airlands, and up to the Money Banks, and then, and then back. And of course, this is still New Guinea. Yeah. So again, Captain John Saris is our, is our uh, guide. So he's still in Banten, so the, the, the Dufkin arrived back. He got a message from a a ship coming from Banda. So Nakata would be a captain. Tinga was the name. Kling is the word for Indian or, or uh, Sri Lankan. So he says they, they went upon the discovery of New Guinea, returned to Banda. Nine of them were killed by heathens. So one of those, well, one of them was killed, speared by Aborigines in Australia. We know that. So the other eight were killed on, when they landed on Papua, by the Papuans or the uh, tribe along the south coast. I can't. But anyway, he says they were constrained to return, finding no good to be done there. So that's pretty much all we know about the details of that, that particular voyage. And we'll look at the next one. So that was 1606. So in um, 1623, there was another Dutch voyage, the Pera and the Arnhem. Again, this is from the Secret Atlas. So that's the coast that was mapped by the Dutch, and they just pick up from somewhere in Cape Kiwiar and, and describe this piece of the coast, and then they separated. The Piera came back the same route, return. The Arnhem decided to come back a different route and discovered uh, Arnhem land on the uh, on the east side of the uh, Gulf of Carpentaria, named appropriately after the, the ship. Now we do have the logs of the Piera and Arnhem, or the Piera at least, and this is a description by their commander, John the Captain, John Carsten, of, uh, of what he saw in, on the coast of Cape York. I'll, I'll let you read that. Does that mean his log was found? Yes, it was. Well, it was. It would probably stay in the archives. So, in, in our judgment, this is the most arid and barren region that can be found anywhere on Earth. The inhabitants, too, are the most wretched and poorest creatures I've ever seen in my age of time. So, you can see the Dutch very quickly lost interest in, uh, in uh, and at least that part of Australia. Now, we now have a first contact memorial, which was erected as recently as 2003, with funds from the Dutch government and the federal government. Geoffrey Malmafond is here, so if anyone's got any question, he was there for the unveiling, and this is his photo, so thank you, Jeff. And uh, there might be some questions about that later. So I don't know if it's exactly at the landing, or the first landing, but uh, it's assumed to be to be close. And there's some of the uh, Mapoon community posing in front of the, uh, the first contact memorial. So I think it's great that that's there. It's, it's sad that it's taken so long in our almost complete understanding of British history and forgetting the Dutch, but uh, it's there now. So if you're ever going that way, something to look out for. So what was uh, also intriguing is 1606, the same year. So in March, we had the Dufkin there. And then in October, we had uh, Taurus sailing through the Taurus. So in the same year, there was two, two um, expeditions that came, landed or came close to Australia. So we'll just move on now to the Spanish story. So this is a French map. It's hard for me or anyone, I think, to find Spanish maps. Perhaps if you go to the, actually go to Madrid or wherever you have to go to, you might get more of these. But this is a French map, 1756, so prior to uh, Cook's voyage. So there was a, um, a Spanish expedition by Mendana. The Spanish obviously thought they found this is a Spirito Santo. So this is Quiros's expedition. So that ex expedition split up, and Quiros, we believe, there was a mutiny. But he sailed back to Acapulco and eventually Spain. So this is his map, or derived from his map, believing they found the east coast of Terra Australis, but which in fact is the uh, the New Hebrides, probably Manawatu, that those islands there. So um, 
obviously that's incorrect. So Corus was left on his own. He was the commander of the other vessel. And I'll just explain this map. So this is a map by Alexander Dalrymple, 1764. And he was the hydrographer or cartographer for the British Admiralty. So he would have prepared this map for Cook's voyage. And I presume that Cook carried that map on the voyage. But after, um, after de Quiros left, and that's his track, and after 15 days, Torres realized that he was on his own. Uh, he had an envelope which said, please, an open in case of emergency. So he opened the envelope. And what it said was, well, continue on to a certain uh, longitude. And if you haven't found Australia or Terra Australis by then, turn north and sail around New Guinea to Manila. So he, he carried out his instructions. He reached this point, hadn't found Terra Australis, and uh, started sailing north. Now, the problem was the prevailing winds did not allow him to sail around the coast of New Guinea. So he had a dilemma. He could have sailed along the south coast, but there was no knowledge of that being more than just a bay. So he took a, quite a tremendous risk, really, to voyage along the south coast. But as we know, he eventually discovered Torres Strait and, uh, and then sailed this way back to Manila. So this is interesting. This is the, as a, you know, the map that Cook would have brought with him. So it shows New Holland, claimed for the, the west and most part of Australia, and of course the unknown east coast. So that tells us pretty much what I just said, I think. So if we just go to the bottom point. So again, we don't have maps of Torres's voyage. Uh, they've been lost. Or well, one of them, the most important one, has been lost. But uh, Captain Brett Hilda, Queensland Master Mariner, from the logs. So the logs and the, the, logs and the maps got back from Manila to Spain. Uh, the most important map is still missing. But from the logs, Captain Brett Hilda demonstrated they would have uh, sailed through the Torres Straits past High Island. And I've got an image of that from somewhere. So, yes, so they would have sailed along here, just coasting along the coast, where they could see the coast. Ran into the Fly River Delta, well, there's the Fly River Delta, ran into this thing here, and then they had to find their way through all the shoals and reefs to find a way to exit the, uh, the Torres Straits. So there's Cape York, that's the high island that that's described, and we believe they've sailed through there. Now, um, Torres never made it back to Spain, the last we know of him was a letter from Manila complaining that they weren't providing a ship for him to get back to Spain, he and his crew, to get back to Spain. Uh, he did send these logs and some maps, I think four maps. Uh, three of those maps still exist and they essentially describe this, this part of the voyage. But the main, the main map which would have shown the Torres Strait part has never been found, so that's, that's missing. Now her Prado, who was his pilot, navigator, second in command, did eventually get back to Manila and he wrote his report as well. So, so we have both those reports to try and reconstruct that voyage. So this is uh, the modern uh, hydrographic map, bathymetric map of, of the Torres Straits. So remember they came across here somewhere and then they would have had to find their way down through all these reefs and eventually out through what is now called the Endeavour Strait, and that would be High Island. So if that's Prince of Wales Island, High Island, they would have come down here. They describe a method of, well, navigation is not the word, of sailing, which is, was new to me, but obviously you don't want to run aground at, uh, at high tide. So they would wait for the, what they thought was high tide. They would then float, and the currents running through the deeper part of the channels would carry them through the deeper part of the channels. And of course, if they did run aground, they would just have to wait for the tide to come back up. So a very clever way of, uh, of getting through all these reefs. So Prado in his report says, we were amongst reefs and shoals for 34 days. There were many large islands and they appeared more on the southern side. So this presumably is the large island on the southern side. And while I'm on this map, um, so we have Possession Island. Now the, the significance of that is that when Cook did sail up the, um, the east coast of Australia and chartered the east coast of Australia, ran aground on the reef, repaired the ship at Cooktown, and then had to make it to the nearest port, which would have been Batavia, or, I don't know, I mean, I'm not a Cook expert, but the plan may not have been to sail through the Torres Straits. But Cook was forced to, to, uh, to get to Batavia, and he stopped at Possession Island, which is about there, uh, raised the flag, and, and claimed all of the east coast of uh, Terra Australis for the British, and named it New South Wales. So we now have the British part of our history. Yes, so I think I've explained this already. Torres never returned to Spain, his fate is unknown. Prado returns to Spain via Portuguese Goa, uh, which 
I guess there weren't any ships going back to, to Acapulco or Mexico, so that was the only option, or his only option. Now this is a very interesting map uh, by this gentleman, Godinho de Redia, you may have heard of. He has an interesting history. He was um, the son of a Portuguese a so-called nobleman and a Macassan princess from uh, uh, Sulawesi. So apparently they eloped and uh, married in Macassar, sorry, in Malacca, they eloped in Malacca. And uh, Godinho was brought up in Malacca, educated there and in Goa. And it's thought this map was, could have been made in Goa. But if you look, we have, um, we have New Guinea on that part there. And then on the other side, we have New Guinea here, and it's an island. Now, the only person who could have known that was Torres or Prado. And we know Prado returned via Goa, so it's more than likely that's the origin of this map. So it, uh, it probably came from Prado's discussions with uh, Godinho in, in Goa. And there are other bits of Australia here, which are more hypothetical, I guess that's right way to explain that. So um, and we have another map. As I said, there's not many Spanish maps that I've been able to find. I think, I think you, if someone wants to do a, a PhD or a master, I think you can well spend one in the files in Spain. So this is also meant to be by Gadunio. I don't know the date. I'm not certain it's his. But you can see that uh, you know it has all the details and all the names of all the all these places along the coast. It clearly shows the the shoals and reefs that uh, Torres would have had to navigate through. There's certainly no indication of that large island to the south we were talking about. It's absent from the map. So, so yeah, I'd like to know more about, about that map. So finally, we're getting to the end. This, I think, is, uh, is the most important map in Australian history because it shows the uh, first time that Australia, or in this case, New Guinea, uh, appears on a, a world map. And this map was here in, what, two years ago when the mapping of the World Exhibition was on in Canberra. So I'll just show you a, a blow up of that, that particular part there. So this is the detail from that uh, map. Well, so that was Hessel Gerritz, by the way, a Dutch cartographer, a BSC cartographer. So there's the piece, this is 1622. So it's after the Carstens, Pera and Arnhem voyage, but it only shows the Dufkin part of that. And there's all this text someone has kindly translated. And it says um, these parts were sailed. So the Dutch must have heard of the Torres voyage. It's interesting that the island of Ternate, which some of us here are very familiar with, uh, at that time there was a Dutch fort on one part side of the island and there was a Spanish fort on the other side of the island. And Torres showed up there uh, and left his tender and 20 men there. That's how the Dutch would have heard about the voyage, but they weren't certain, at least those making the maps. So the translation says these parts were sailed with Yacht of the Quiris or Torres, which would be here, uh, about New Guinea on 10 degrees westward, through many islands, dry banks, over two, three, four fathoms for a full 40 days, which we know already. Now they say that, um, presuming New Guinea, this New Guinea, uh, does not stretch over 10 degrees to the south, if this were the case, then the land from 9 to 14 degrees must be separate and different from the other New Guinea, so Australia. <laughs> so that's, that's really all I've got, I think. There's a little one here that tells me I've finished. There's some images of the Dufkin replica on the, when it sailed to Banda, and, uh, and thank you for your attention. Harry, and I'm sure you'll take some questions. Certainly. Yes. So, questions. Uh, something I, I didn't understand. If the map by Torres disappeared, and perhaps it was held secret deliberately, perhaps, how did Dalrymple get a map uh, to, to, for Cook? Yeah, very good question. <laughs> Excellent question. Um, we'll just find that map if we can. There it is. Yes, so Dal Ripple was the hydrographer or cartographer of the British Admiralty. The English East India Company, or at this stage it might have already been the British East India Company, raided Manila and captured uh, or occupied Manila for a short period of time. I've forgotten exactly how long. But Dal Ripple was able to access the maps in the Manila archives. And until that time, when he did that, you know, the English did not know or only heard rumours about the Torres Strait. Had, had the Spanish deliberately kept that quiet? Uh, no, I think maps get stolen, souvenir, disappeared, because um, Torres sent four maps, I think, back. So three are there, the most insignificant maps. The most important one is not, or has, hasn't been found yet. Is probably the appropriate answer. But there was enough there for Dal Rimple to. Uh, well, yeah, he, in Manila. Yes. Yeah, not in Spain. But it was very important for Cook because 
someone who's a cook expert can probably tell me more, but he's, might have, you know, he might have been going somewhere else. But the fact that he knew that was a strait meant he could take the shortest route to Batavia with a badly damaged vessel. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I've got another question down the back. It's not about maps, but having been in charge of uh, ships in the past, I was intrigued in your statement that the first voyage to the Dutch East Indies was uh, a failure because of the problems of the command. Could you elaborate? <laughs> yes. All right, thank you for that question. Um, yes, the commander was Cornelius de Hootman. He got to Banten. They were welcomed. Well, they, firstly, they didn't realize the port, they didn't expect the Portuguese. They were told the Portuguese were not trading in Banta, money in Malacca. So when they got there, they, they were welcomed by the Portuguese. <laughs> so that was a surprise. And then they were told that I think four or five Chinese vessels had just left Banta, loaded with all the spices they could have bought to sail back to China. So it didn't appear there were many spices in Banta to buy, but there were some. But Cornelius de Hoekman would not, did not agree to the price. And he had men ashore, he sent his, whatever you call them, the, the buyers ashore. And, uh, and anyway, they, they, he wouldn't agree to the price. And then a vessel arrived from Banda, loaded with nutmeg and cloves. And the Dutch decided, as, as you did in those days, well, we'll just capture that vessel. So they captured that vessel and started unloading all those spices onto their boat. Meanwhile, the, I don't know how many men were ashore, say 20 men were ashore. They were imprisoned as ransom. And there was a standoff. So eventually, I think the men got back. I'm not certain about that. And Hootman left. But as he was leaving, he bombarded the town with his cannon just to say, just to say goodbye. Thank you. Just a comment. Um, the Deutkin apparently had two cannon in the stern. The Portuguese were surprised yeah. by this. And um, I wonder if there are any other aspects of Dutch uh, maritime technology that would have uh, assisted them in defeating the Portuguese. I'm not an expert in Dutch maritime technology, but uh, I'm just assuming or have been told that uh, you know the cannon were better prepared, their accuracy and range was better, so and there's someone's got something to add. Okay, we've got a question down the back. I arrived a few minutes late, so you may have made reference to this, but I doubt it. My query is, in your research of the Portuguese, is there anything, any clues you had as to the history or the possibility of their truth of the mahogany ship down near Warrenville? Uh, no, you didn't, miss, you didn't miss anything as far as that was concerned. You know, I don't know any more than probably you do, but I assume if it was really there, uh, it could be discovered by ground penetrating radar, and that may have already been done, I don't know. But I'm sure if it still is there, and someone's serious about finding it, it, it could be found. I'll ask you to join me in thanking Ian. It's fantastic. Thank right. you so much.